It's kind of a unique uh, celebration. We had All Souls fall on a Saturday, and All Souls, it actually is such a high-ranking feast, it, 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 uh, it trumps actually a Sunday of ordinary time. And so last night at the 5.30 vigil, we, we had to say the All Souls Mass, but the church also offered the offer, uh, option that the All Souls Mass could go through the whole weekend. And so that's why we're, we're celebrating that, this, that celebration at the, at the Masses this morning. And it's, a, it's, a, it's important because we, we're starting the month of November, the month of November, which is the close of our liturgical year. And it's a, it's a time where we especially remember those who have died. Uh, and, and in particular, for, for those who have died in our parish. Because so I know there's lots of us here who have lost someone, and lost someone perhaps recently. It gives us pause to consider about the ultimate realities of life. And the, the two realities that the church proposes for us on All Souls Day is the reality of death and purgatory. Death is a great mystery. Like I said, so, some of us have, have lost someone that we care about. Whom have we lost? Whom are we missing? As we consider that the reality of death, that death is something that comes for everyone. You know, no matter how far, how much we advance in the medical sciences, the last I checked, the mortality rate of the human race is still the same, 100%. Right? And without faith, people have a very difficult or even impossible time facing this reality and live their lives, and we, we live in a culture and a world that encourages this, to live their lives in a way that distracts them from this most inevitable and inescapable of realities. But if we want to be thoughtful people, if we want to be wise, as we just heard that passage from the Book of Wisdom, if we want to be wise, we want the truth about reality. We don't want to distract ourselves from from reality, even, even if how uncomfortable or unpleasant it might be. Because it's only by facing that mystery, the mystery that this earthly life has an end, will I know how to live this life wisely. The spiritual maxim that comes from our tradition is this, two, two Latin words, memento mori, remember death. It expresses a deep wisdom of human life and the life of a true Christian. That this life is temporary and is over before we know it. I've talked to people well into their 90s and they'll often say, you know what? My life has gone pretty fast. And I, I, I'm experiencing this too, being well into middle age, is that time seems to accelerate the, the, the older we get. And so it seems like we have, you know, when we're younger, we have this endless stretch of life ahead of us. But in reality, no, there, is, there, there comes an end. And actually, we start to feel that end come more quickly the, the older we get. Sometimes I, I look down at my hand and I think, gosh, who does that belong to? <laughs> you know, you can, we can remember back when I was 13 or 14 years old like it was yesterday. Right? And that's, that's quite a few decades in the, in the, in the rearview mirror now. But, we, but the, the, the wise person will consider that, consider the fact that this truth of my life, that it will have an end, that death will come to me. In fact, I just had this, that is uh, in a very clear sort of way, in between the masses. So I finished the 8.30 mass, checked my phone, call from Kaiser. Between the masses, I race over to Kaiser, anointed a guy who, had, who died right there. And we didn't, you know, he, he, had, he was an older gentleman, a parishioner over at St. John the Baptist, but did, that, that day came for him on this, on this Sunday in November. Right? And so, it's, and so, and so we, want to, we, want to, we want to remember that. Right? You, you've heard me share this line from St. Therese of Lisieux before. When she, she says, remember the world is thy ship, not thy home. So to how to live this life Facing the reality of death, we can turn to the spiritual classic, The Imitation of Christ. 
spiritual classic written in the 1400s, Thomas Akempis, must read for all Christians after the Bible. Uh, it, it is, it's a classic because it's perennial, what is, what is written in that book. And here's what Thomas Akempis writes in The Imitation of Christ. It says this, Every action of yours, every thought, should be those of one who expects to die before the day is out. If you aren't fit to fe face death today, it's very unlikely you will be tomorrow. There's the wisdom that comes from, 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 from facing this reality as a Christian. To live each day as it might be my last. What are, the, what are the changes in my life I would make if I knew that this was my last day? What would I say? Whom do I need to forgive? What do I need to put in order in my life? That's the, that's the wise living. And, I, and what St. Thomas Akempis, or what Thomas Akempis says is that if I live each day like that, then when that day actually comes, I'm ready. And we face that reality of death as a Christian. You know, our Lord Jesus remembered death. He talked about it several at several points in the gospel. He, he mentions his hour. The, when, he, when Jesus says, my hour has not yet come, or now is the hour, it's a, he's referring to his passion and death, his redemption. And this is the beautiful and powerful and hope-filled aspect of being a Christian. This is reason enough to be a Christian, is the fact that God himself, the incarnate Son, underwent death as man for us, so that we do not face it alone. In fact, God himself has taken that into himself and destroyed its power so that it is no longer the end but a doorway back to him. He changed death by his own death. As he said in the Gospel of John, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains a single grain but if it dies, it bears much fruit. That's what his death has done for us. And so he asks us to follow him through his cross and death into the glory of his resurrection. And that's why as Christians, what we believe and we can face death with hope is because we know it's not the last word. It is not the end of our existence. It changes, but it is not the end. And in, in doing this, it's also perfectly natural to, to be somewhat fearful of death, to have an aversion to it. Why? Because God did not make us for death. Death is not from God. It came from sin. It came from distancing ourselves from God. There's something, death is not something that was originally human. It became part of our condition because of, because of sin. And so we, when we, fa we face that with faith and hope and love, with the power of Jesus in us, with him, and then we can turn to that second mystery, purgatory. Today's commemoration means to pray for those who have died. And, it's, and purgatory is, is actually a great mercy of a good God. We see references to it made in the book of Maccabees, and in, in the New Testament, in Matthew 25, and more clearly in 1 Corinthians, that, but we think about it this way, you know, nothing impure can enter into the presence of God, can handle the intensity of heaven and its glory and love, of seeing Jesus face to face. And let's face it, if there was anything, uh, some unfinished business with the Lord, if there's any sort of impurity still in our soul, we would want that cleaned off before we entered into the wedding feast of the Lamb. So few of us die being totally purified. And so without this, this final purgation, very few of us would ever make it to heaven. And here, here's what the church teaches about this in the catechism. is church says, all who die in God's grace, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. 
but after death they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. So as someone who dies in God's grace, that is not in mortal sin, but still imperfectly purified, there is joy in heaven because they know the, 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 the soul knows that they, they are saved, but there's suffering in it as that final purgation happens. You can think of it more of a, a process than a place. Think of, of, of the Lord pulling the soul to him, close to him in union with him, which is what his desire is, through the fire of his love. And that fire of love is going to burn off anything residual in that soul that is not love. And so coming through that uh, process to come out on the other side, able to be so united to God. You know, St. Catherine of Genoa, who was a great mystic and, and wrote uh, a lot about, about purgatory, she, she says this, If a soul were brought to see God, who still had a trifle of which to purge itself, a great injury would be done to it. Conversely, a great happiness is granted to the holy souls that grows as they draw nearer to God. For every glimpse which can be had of God exceeds any pain or joy a man can feel. The holy souls clearly see God to be on fire with an extreme love for them. Strongly and unceasingly, this love draws the soul into that uniting look as though it had nothing else to do than this. It's a beautiful sort of image of the glimpses of God where the soul sees the Lord exceedingly on fire with love for that soul, to bring that soul in union with him. And so purgatory isn't between heaven and hell. It's actually the anteroom of heaven. And that's why we can say we call them holy souls in purgatory. And that's why we also call them poor souls because of the, of the, of the suffering that, that happens in that purification. And so here is where the connection happens. We are all members of the mystical body of Christ. And so they are helped by our prayers and sacrifices. So I've, you've heard me say this before. Here at the Mass, the most powerful of prayers, that the veil between this life and those we have lost and loved is very thin. And the souls that are undergoing that purgation, that final purgation, are immensely helped by this sacrifice, which is why it's important that we have a funeral mass when we die, that we have masses said for those we know who have died. That's why we pray for the dead, when we visit a cemetery, especially this week uh, where we can get that, that indulgence. It's like where we offer up our sacrifices. You know, when we, when we stub our toe or cut ourselves or get sick, right? we unite it and say, Jesus, I unite this to the cross for your souls in purgatory. That actually helps. It helps. And we, and we do that not only because the Lord wants us to do it, but God willing, we'll be in that, in that spot at some point and we'll need those prayers from, from, the, from the church on earth at that time. So let us, let us rejoice in the faith that the Lord has given us to be able to face reality as it is with faith and hope and love in Jesus Christ, that we can face that reality of death and especially pray for those who are undergoing that final purgation. Eternal rest granted to them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen.